let's hand over to Erin brooks Pollock from the University of Bristol um, for her talk on contacts and behaviours during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, hi, yeah, it's my restriction because I've got to pick a three-year-old up who will be waiting outside school for me at three o'clock. Um, so uh, this was the title that I was given. Um, thanks very much for inviting me to take part in, in this um, in this whole series of workshops that look really interesting. So I was asked to talk about contacts and behaviours during the COVID-19 pandemic and I'm a mathematical modeller based at the University of Bristol so um, the general approach um, the approach that I'm taking uh, or kind of my perspective is from a modeller a modeller's point of view. Uh, let me see. All oh, right so um, in, so just kind of taking a step back and thinking about why we want to know about social contact patterns in the first place. Sexual, um, if we contrast it with sexually transmitted diseases, really since the 1980s, uh, there's been um, an understanding that sexual networks and the number of sexual contacts that an individual has is really important for uh, increase for your risk of catching a sexually transmitted disease. And that means that um, measuring sexual networks was really an integral part of understanding uh, the epidemiology and transmission of sexually transmitted diseases. And I always show this, um, this, this sexual network from a secondary school um, in America um, to, my, to my students, um, just because it's so cool <laughs> how connected it is. Uh, but that wasn't really the same for respiratory diseases. Uh, because it was thought that, well, because of the, the more nebulous nature of a social contact, it was thought that it was difficult to really quantify what a social contact was. And then if you went out and surveyed them, surveyed them it would be difficult to, um, to really quantify the reliability of um, measuring social contact patterns. Um, Oops. But this really changed, I think, in 2009 um, when we had the swine flu pandemic um, and there we saw this huge impact of social contact patterns and changing social contact patterns. So this is data from the UK on the number of daily infections um, of swine flu uh, in children, which is in red, and in adults, um, adults in blue crosses. And you saw this first wave that took off before the school summer holidays. And then during the summer holidays, children changed their contact patterns massively by not going to school. Uh, and we saw a decline in the number of cases, which then picked up again for the second wave when schools went back in September. And so I think really this cemented the importance of social contact patterns and including social contact patterns in infectious disease models and really at the heart of all infectious disease models is a, a model of how social contacts um, work in a population. So some of the first social contact surveys that were done were done by John Edmonds and his colleagues uh, back in the 1990s and he surveyed 65, 64 or 65 people um, with just a paper-based survey and um, he uh, and from from the firstly he showed that it could be done and that the data were were somewhat reliable this is one of the figures from his papers from this paper in the 97 paper and some of the things that Stephen was talking about come out in um, even in the small, these small data sets you can see this is the distribution of age contacts according to the person the respondent the age of the respondent and you can see how the age increases um, as as a respondent increases uh, so people are much more likely to contact uh, other people of similar age. Uh, then you saw Stephen was talking about the, the polynod that was published in 2008 and this was really the first really large-scale social contact survey which was conducted in multiple different European countries and you always see these lovely coloured in matrices so the lighter colours are where uh, represent higher numbers of average contacts between ages and the blue color is lower numbers of contacts so on average uh, polymod found that there were about 10 to 12 people had about 10 to 12 social contacts in any given day um, 
here these the highest number of contacts were in children and young adults so this white area here i don't know if you can see my mouse or not uh, as stephen was talking about you have this diagonal line of people who are contacting other people of similar ages and then you also have these off diagonals with which are intergenerational contacts between families and then in some countries you have a contact with grandparents as well particularly places like italy um, and the polymod was one of a number of different social contact surveys that happened at about the same time another was the social contact survey done by matt keeling and john reed and others at warwick um, and they showed amongst other things that this huge variety in the type of social contacts that you get and what kind of distribution you of numbers of contacts you find per individual so um i've got one slide from comix but i can see chris and amy are talking later on so i won't talk about comix very much but um one of the things we did is we used we based uh, we implemented a questionnaire particularly for the university of bristol looking uh, essentially repeating the social contact survey but during um during covid um and uh, emily's published some of these results in this paper here um so it's an online survey people could take part at any time we asked people to fill it in every week or every eight days and um for, for these data here we've got about 1600 participants but it's still going on so there's no reason why people can't sign up and we've just had another push for people um signing up now and uh, what we did or what daniel stocks did which was um, a student that he did for his master's project is he looked at the social contact surveys which was done in 2010 and compared it with conquest data in 2000 20 during COVID. Uh, and here you can see the comparison of the distributions between these two surveys. So this is number of contacts on the horizontal axis. Um, so firstly, you can see that a high proportion, or oh, actually can't see on this, but a high proportion of respondents in Conquest reported no contacts on the previous day. So almost one in five people, whereas no one in the social contact survey reported no, no social contacts. You can also see the general change in the shape of the distribution um, during 2020 compared to compared to 10 years earlier and this resulted overall in a shift in the median number of contacts in the social contact survey from nine to two during 2020 so obviously a massive change not only did the numbers of contacts change but really the nature of those contacts changed as well so we asked about how long contacts were for so um the blue the blue bars here are from 2020 and the orange ones are from 2010 and you can see that in general it was the shorter contacts so contacts that were less than an hour that we got rid of during 2020 but we retained our long intense contacts that lasted more than an hour um, also when we think about frequency it was the the irregular contacts that we really got rid of during 2020 with the lockdowns um, and you can see the blue bars are much lower for kind of frequent um, but not everyday contacts that, that occurred but um, the contacts that did remain tended to be often Um, so, and this, so these kind of patterns, so one of the biggest surveys was really repeated in or was echoed up results from COMIX, which was one of the biggest social contact surveys that happened during 2020. And uh, as I said, I saw Chris and Amy are talking about this later. But one of the things that we really wanted to understand with a different survey was to really understand what it was about the contacts that remain so we know that the number of contacts dropped to around two or three during lockdown but what was it about those contacts that still um that are still left because those are obviously the contacts that um define your risk of getting infected um so to do that we linked up with this cohort study this birth cohort study that was that has been going on in bristol since the 1990s it's called ausbac um, or children of the 90s 
um, Nick Timpson here is is the PI and Kate is the, the data manager. Amy Thompson is the person who did all the work. Um, here, this shows you what the, co the cohort actually looks like. So it was a birth cohort. Women who were pregnant in 1991-92 were recruited into the study. So uh, on the left here, you can see all their kids. Uh, these were people who were born in 91 and 92. And then this distribution here is their parents. These were the people who were pregnant in 91 or 92. So they've got about 12,000 people who have been filling in surveys since the 90s. Um, so this provides a really rich data source to really understand what's happening with social contacts and behaviours um, during COVID. Um, so we had the opportunity to add in a social contact survey as part of their COVID questionnaire. Um, and this survey was rolled out to the to the ASPAC participants in April, May 2020, and just over half of people responded, uh, which is just nearly 7,000 people. Um, this is the, the contact survey that we added in. So just how many people, apart from those you live with, did you speak to yesterday for the following reasons? So, uh, and this was then divided into four different age groups. From, from this Children of the 90s ASPAC survey, we found that there were some differences than um, compared to COMICS and the university survey. And we had a higher number of contacts occurring outside the household. So on average, 3.7 contacts outside the household during this period. Um, although 42% of people did record no contacts outside the home at all. This plot here shows the distribution of contacts and you can see that, uh, and this is a negative binomial fit, which actually fitted much better than even a zero inflated negative binomial model. Um, we found there was a strong correlation with your household size, as you might expect, and total numbers of contacts. And that really varied with the age of the participants. So we found that younger people lived in larger households and had more social contacts during lockdown than older people in general. That was really, it turned out, driven by whether you lived with children or not. So um, having children in your household both increased your household size and increased your numbers of contacts outside your household. So there was a real, a, a big difference seen between people who had children at home and who didn't have children at home. And then finally, um, we also looked at the impact of what people actually did for their jobs. So here we've categorised it into non-essential, which is labelled other healthcare workers and key workers. And healthcare workers had um, four and a half times more social contact than non-essential workers. And the other group that came out were teachers and police um, and members of the police force had about three times as many contacts as non-essential workers. And um, um, I think this data from this data from children of the 90s is an open resource. So I'd encourage anyone to go and look at it um, or contact us and discuss it if that would be more useful. Because one of the things that we're planning to look at, I mean, they also have infection status of all these people. So it's a real opportunity to link infection status with um, with numbers of social contacts. And I mean, they have they have any amount of data that you could imagine on these individuals in the cohort and they know whether they were breastfed in the 90s um, or you know what vaccines they had so it's a really amazing resource uh, which can link these social contacts with other other outcomes that you might be interested in um, and then just one other thing i know there's several other um, uh, sessions later on in the week looking at what really the impact is of this changing behaviour during 2020 and I was just going to add in one of our analysis we've been looking at contact tracing during 2020 uh, well contact tracing using the 2020 contact patterns compared to 2010 contact patterns and we find that because of the social distancing restrictions um, your predictions for how effective contact tracing would be it is less than if you just assumed the regular 2010 contact patterns. Uh, so here you can see numbers of secondary cases with and without contact tracing using 
2020 like contact patterns and difference there is a difference but the difference is much smaller than you might expect so I, i'm just i feel like i'm rushing through this but it's because i'm planning to leave very soon so just uh, um in summary um these social contacts are kind of an essential part of what well, of both modeling and really understanding an individual's risk we know that social contacts changed a lot during 2020 but the contacts that remained really um indicate an individual's intrinsic ability to reduce their social contacts and not everybody was able to reduce their social contacts to very low levels um, if you had living with kids depending on what work you did you still had high numbers of contacts which led to um, increased risk associated with infection um, and, and that's it i've got and there are some other just pointers to things that might be interesting to look at related to uh, modeling that was done during during the pandemic and also the juniper modeling consortium thanks sorry for rushing through it uh, thank you very much helen um and yeah just conscious of your time so we'll go um if anyone has any questions please do um, raise your hand that's probably faster but um if not then do leave them in the chat and um, i believe ellen will try and join at 4 p.m um so if you do have questions and that need a bit more time then maybe we can leave them until then but yeah happy to take a couple of questions now um cool um okay so i think we'll just leave it until the discussion session if, if that works um for you ellen um i'm sure by then people will will have some things to say